This is Dateline News and Conversation. Oh, my guest tonight is somebody special. I've known him for quite a long time. It's Dean Henderson. He's the author of seven books. I have read all of them. And it was after reading his first book that I got in touch with him and we began to... Count was frozen. Gives you an idea about who was probably not liking very much what Dean was talking about. Dean, welcome back to the show. It's been a while. Great to see you, Regis. I know. I'm really glad to see you again and know that you're okay. You have had such an incredible influence on my life, and I'm sure on the many other people who have read your books, or seen you on any number of shows. But I want to talk tonight about your most recent book that I could not put down. The title of the book is Royal Bloodline, Wetiko, and the Great Remembering. Dean, first of all, um, let's start with this title. And I, I, I'd like you to explain for me and our audience, Watiko, what, what is that all about? Yeah, sure. So it's definitely a book um, of tragedy and hope. Um, the first part of the title is the tragedy that's been imposed upon humanity for, by my reckoning, 8,500 years. And the last half, the great remembering is what a lot of people call, I guess, the great awakening. And I think I explained in the book why it's actually remembering um, of who we really are. So Wachiko is a word that um, it's it's a Cree word, um, Cree Indians. They live uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, up into Canada. Um, all along, you know, that area in Michigan. And um, Wetiko is a word that they used to describe the closest, and it's, you know, it's translation. It's always hard with the native languages, but closest really translation most people could come up with is it's akin to a cannibal, but it's uh, but it's worse because it's, it's a cannibal of the soul. So I think a lot of people, like maybe the hippies would call them energy vampires, you know. Um, but the, the Apache had a word, uh, Windigo, the the uh, Lakota from my home turf, South Dakota. Uh, Crazy Horse's name was Tashunka Witko. And Witko is the same, except in Crazy Horse. It's like the word crazy in English. Crazy can mean, you know, can be crazy good or it can be crazy bad. And in this case, it means crazy bad. These, so they they use this uh, to describe uh, a mentality, really more than anything, or a way of thinking, a way of perceiving the the natural world and the human world, and and just every, the world. And it really it's a fear based uh, deal uh, where you know it's almost like a first strike mentality where you know. And it's sort of like, well, I'm going to, you know, go and blow up this country before they can, you know, do something to our country or like this. And um, I think it's, uh, it, to my understanding, it's it's really synonymous with archons, which, um, you know, in, in Egypt with the Nag Hammadi scrolls, the Gnostics who bury those scrolls called this, these people and this energy, they represented archons. Um, I think it's akin to the Nephilim, which is also synonymous with Anunnaki, which is also, in my understanding, synonymous with artificial intelligence and with maybe high technology, computer technology. Um, but these things are all not from here. That's the, that's the common denominator. They don't come from the natural world, you know, that we were born into here on earth. We're people of the earth. 
we're not people of the sky um which is why they're always trying to tell us we have these great benevolent people in the sky who are gonna take us to heaven or you know take us up on their spaceships i guess or on the history channel you see how these gods from the sky they they came here and they uh were so gracious and gave us all this knowledge and helped us so much and we were so backwards that they had to help us and all this stuff um but that's what Wetiko means is cannibal of the soul and and I, and like i say in my understanding it's, it's synonymous with all these other things it's it's an it's a mentality that's not natural that's not earth-based uh it's based on fear and and fear is the opposite of love and when it boils right down to it the cosmic uh conflict is coming to a head here and it's going to be fear versus love and you're going to see a stark contrast opening a chasm opening between those who embrace fear and those who embrace love you know those who embrace narcissism and those who embrace helping others and being helpful and being compassionate and reciprocating and you know just caring uh which is the natural way which is normal human behavior which currently we are trying you know they're trying to, to to separate us from that even more than they already have with our push into agriculture our push into then industrialism or push into then four industrial revolutions now um all a process of human enslavement which again started by my reckoning 8500 years ago when the anunnaki landed in sumeria um, from the planet Nibiru and and basically colonize the earth for their own purposes interbred with the humans uh, it's the whole Garden of Eden story you know there's two versions in the Bible it's Genesis 6 where God put all the plants and the animals and trees and the rocks here and then he put us here because everything was to be provided for by creator Wakantanka God whatever your your name for the good force that created this universe is and Nobody can tell me there's not a, a benevolent force because it's all perfect, right? And so these people come here, I guess, you know, according to the clay tablets in Samaria, which are the oldest written language we know, cuneiform language, um, you know, right in the, at the mouth of the Tigris and Euphrates in Iraq. Uh, that's where they landed. That was, that was Samaria, and it's now Iraq. And it was conveniently roped off to researchers right at the time when Sitchin and, and David Ike and a whole lot of other people were delving into this stuff and going, wait a minute, maybe this is our real history. And but it talks about how the Sumerians uh you know talk about how they were they were forced into agriculture. And so some of the first part of the book I get into agriculture and what that means. And I grew up on a farm and I've owned farms my whole life. Uh, up until just recently and I've been a farmer on a small scale but maybe a real farmer instead of an agribusinessman let's say um, always about producing food always about you know trying to separate myself from the Babylon system and was successful at it <laughs> and um, so now but anyway you go back to farming and you know farmers always say well you know let's oh, let's go do something well I'm, I'm kind of tied to the farm i kind of have to be here and, and that's kind of the story um they they enslaved the sumerians into agriculture um and they moved into the cities of babylon and ur and uh, all these these cities in that area and they basically were lazy slave drivers who didn't want to work so they had the native earth people the sumerians produce their agriculture uh, for them produce their food for them and then you know amazingly you know big coincidence right i guess um king sargon who's an anunnaki goes to um india in the indus valley and agriculture springs up there and then agriculture springs up in china and, and in central america and in south america and all all at the same time and at this at the very same time all these temples were built uh whether it's Angkor Wat or whether it's Taj Mahal or whether it's um Tikal or Chichen Itza or Machu Picchu these were all built Godepa Tepe in Turkey 
um, all these were built at the same time that agriculture came into being. So what happened, in my estimation, is that all the people of the earth at that time were forced into agriculture to feed the temple priesthood, um, which were the Anunnaki, which were not benevolent, which taught the native people how to sacrifice humans and maybe forced them to sacrifice humans. Uh, the Garden of Eden story, the serpent tempts Eve to take a bite out of the apple. And this is all about the enslavement of people from hunting and gathering societies to a cultivar based livestock herding based uh, sedentary way of life, which created a, a, a lot of paranoia in people right off the bat too, because all of a sudden you're at odds with nature. All of a sudden a hawk can get your chickens or a coyote can get your sheep or the wind can blow down your corn or a tornado can blow away, you know, and, and you're, and you've, you you can not move. You're, you're stuck there. Um, you begin to accumulate possessions and possessions tend to what possess you and, and you become cold and you become more interested in possessions than your family, than humanity, than nature. And all these things that that become that happen when agriculture replaces hunting and gathering and foraging societies and you build fences and, you know, a class system springs up because there's one guy in, in the area who's going to build an elevator, of, you know, to store the grain. And even to this day, you know, grain storage, grain shipping is huge because it's whoever ships the grain, stores the grain, has the capacity to store the grain. That can sit on the grain and wait for the markets to be manipulated and then sell the grain. And Cargill fills that role today. 50% uh, of the world's grain trade is controlled by the Cargill Corporation. It's a private corporation owned by a handful of families. Um, but but it was so then too. And so a class system, you know, comes into being, which didn't exist. Hunting and gathering societies were very egalitarian. Um, the abuse of women comes into uh, domestic abuse and, and men, I suppose, by crazy women comes into being because um, there's so much work to do and, and it has to be and it's stressful and nobody knows their roles anymore. And, you know, there's always a role for women in hunting and gathering society, a role for men. And, and everyone's role was praised. Uh, in, in those days, bravery was valued. This is one thing that's really a problem in our society. Bravery is, is beat down. And a lot of times they've conditioned the female even to beat down the male bravery within your own household and keep you at bay so that you don't get at these Anunnaki's and just tear them to shreds. And so this, this all happened and this was all bad. And, 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 uh, you know, it doesn't mean I hate farmers. I love farmers. I'm a farmer, but it just, it's just, it's a deconstruction of the process. Okay. And, 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 and of course, then we move into, yeah. So anyway, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. We just, but, but that's uh, a long answer to, uh, to kind of the meaning of the title of the book and kind of the, the gist of uh, the beginning of it. Anyway. Well, thanks to you and one Zechariah Zitchin who wrote, mm -hmm. I don't know, it was 12 oh, okay. books, maybe whatever. I read every single one of them 30 years ago mm -hmm. and uh, I lost a lot of Catholic Christian friends because of how I yeah. viewed all of that and the Anunnaki and everything you're talking about and the reinterpretation of a lot of Old Testament myths and New Testament stories. Mm -hmm. But what I want to mm -hmm. go back to, uh, because I, for a period of five years, worked with the Hopi Indian tribe, their government, in northern Arizona, mm -hmm. and I had to quit that job when I realized that what I was trying to do to help their government become more effective and efficient, which was the rage and the crave at that time in the 90s, right. uh, and then I, I met people from their 12 different tribes, 12 different communities scattered across this plateau. And I realized that I was doing to these native original peoples. And that's when I first 
I think, became aware mm -hmm. of what you're talking about, mm -hmm. what was natural, what was basic and human. And that's been on my mind ever since, and that's over 30 years now. Mm -hmm. And then I read your books, and I don't know that there's anyone who's currently writing that has been uh, as clear and factual and demonstrated such incredible research as you have. But let's talk just a little bit now on this basic humanity, which I think <clears throat> many of the original peoples around the world uh, who've been forced into reservations, who've been isolated, I don't care where it is, North America, Australia, doesn't matter, they still and I know some of them, as you do, feel that they have a message for us, the Wetiko, or as the Hopi called us, they called me the Bahana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Bahana. Let's, talk, let's talk about those relationships a little bit more, Dean, because yeah. at the end of your book, you talk about the great remembering, being people being awakened, not woke, but awakened about what is our intrinsic nature? What, Who are we really? And I think this is probably the most important question that people have to ask themselves today. Who the hell are we? Dean, yeah. talk to me a little bit about those basic relationships, not only with each other, but with the animals, with the plants, with the earth, with the water, with everything around them. And the native people still hold on to that. And we call them primitive, or we call them uncivilized, and we call them savages. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty rich, you know. Um, since the real savages, of course, are the people that live in the castles in Europe who you know, long story short, that's the, that's where the Anunnaki bloodline resides. So it's the royalty, uh, which is one single bloodline, um, which I discovered writing this book. I learned a lot. Um, so Native people across the board, um, and I, I've studied a ton of cultural anthropology. I took a lot of Lakota studies classes in undergrad. I took more classes, uh, Native American history and different things um, in my getting my master's degree you know I lived in South Dakota my dad took me out hunting on the uh, Northern Cheyenne Reservation and um, my town was a bunch of racists who you know ran down Indians you know behind their backs and made jokes about them my dad was exception in that town there was a handful of people who didn't do that Maybe not even a handful but he definitely was one of them Taught me to respect the Indians. Uh, he was one of the only people that they would white person who they would let hunt on that reservation because he showed respect. And he also invited them to hunt on our land because they had antelope and grouse. We had deer and pheasants and ducks and geese. So, and they did. And so I, I, I was lucky, you know, I, I just, my dad taught me so much about how you treat people. My dad understood uh, the relationships that you're talking about and it's really simple you know the, the native view is is two things reciprocity you know reciprocity not just to other people but to but to nature to the animals to the plants um and it's and it's understanding that life is a circle so you know Wutiko think that you just go in a straight line and you get what's yours and the hell with everyone else and Native view is more, you know, circular to where, you know, if you uh, do good things in life, it comes back around and it makes your next, your very next step in life easier, your very next step. And it's a scientific fact <laughs> that that's true. It's been, now it's being proven by the new science, you know, people talking to water and it reacting to sadness and plants reacting to you know, they're going to get sad when they're going to get harvested. And the, all this stuff is 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 now acknowledged uh, by even mainstream science. And yet 
people still can, because of the royal bloodline um, indoctrination through the royal societies, because the royal society, you know, first they corrupted the Catholic Church, then they corrupted the Protestant Church. They hid behind each of them so that people would blame the Catholics for things, and then later would blame the religion in general for things, but hid behind it being satanic um pagans is what they were and indians aren't pagans by the way so uh lefty folks need to get that right because uh lakota where i come from are monotheistic and they believe in wakantanka and it's the great mystery we don't understand it we're humble people we're stupid we don't really understand but we just really appreciate your your, your creation that you made us and we're so appreciative of that creation again the reciprocity in the circle of life and this is this is a scientific fact and that's why when crazy psychopaths you know like israel and ukraine and then the people that handle those entities which in the end again is the crown we can get into that um they don't understand reality and so they end up when the circle comes back the snake eats its tail and it's aurora boris and they don't understand reality the reality doesn't change just because you perceive it in a different way it's still reality you know so you can live a life and be a shit heel and your life's going to be miserable or you can live a life and be a good person and your life's going to be good and yeah you're running even as a good person you run into shit heels but you learn to deal with them too and in general your life is is good and so it's just science <laughs> and I would argue that the Indians were, the, you know, they were the real scientists because after the Anunnaki corrupted the Catholic Church through the Council of Nicaea, 300 AD, Constantine the Great, a Habsburg, uh, just changed everything um, that Peter and Jesus and any real Christian would have done or thought or perceived. Then they go to the Protestant Reformation, which they totally funded and corrupt that by saying you don't have to do good acts to go to heaven you can just poof you know jesus is my savior i pray i go to church i go to heaven poof up to the sky gods right and then they corrupted um science and this is where the royal societies come in and that was their next move um so they got behind science and and they corrupted it and they turned it into not science but they, it's see, been, let me Go ahead. Let, let, me get, let me get back to the original people understood science as it was is and what it was meant to be. I think it's important for people to have a better, clearer understanding of what you're talking about, reciprocity. You have a wonderful story at the end of your book when you're out in a snowstorm and you're seeing the deer crossing the road. Talk to me a little bit now about this reciprocity that the original peoples, wherever they were, scared it around the globe, understood in relationship to each other, to animals, mm -hmm. to trees, and to plants, to water. Tell me a little bit more about how they viewed this reciprocity. And it should be obvious that how far we've come away from that understanding. Sure. Well, okay. So, for example, uh, Again, Lakota people in my, where I grew up, um, people, you know, they, 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 the, the bison, the buffalo was a huge um, part of their culture um, because they were displaced by the settlers moving east. And at one time, they actually gardened more. They actually, you know, were more semi nomadic. But when the settlers came in, they had to hit the road and, and go where they weren't going to get killed, basically. And so the bison and the buffalo became a huge thing. So, you know, when Lakota, um, Lakota have a, a, you know, a helper, it's called a helper, called white buffalo calf woman. And the reason they do is because they depend on the bison to survive. And so they talk to the bison, they, they, they hang out with the bison. And then they run the bison over cliffs when they need food because they didn't that's the easy way there's these in west river south dakota and wyoming and nebraska and out that way there's these kind of i don't know people call them gulches or 
they're kind of these overhangs where you can run animals into a, you know, so they'd run over the cliff, you know, um, go down butcher them, haul the meat out, um, and always uh, followed by a day of prayer. Um, and what we what we perceive as prayer, I would say, you know, it's a little different, but it's it's more or less um, thank you thank you to the bison for providing the food, and and thank you for the bison for providing the hide that we make our teepees and our moccasins out of. And, and thank you for the bison for providing the bones that we make our knives out of and our utensils out of. And they use every bit. Uh, they use the gallbladder as a water carrying sack, you know, um, everything. And it was huge. And they knew it was huge. And because they knew it was huge, they would have a, a good hunt next year. You know, they would they they would have a good hunt next year by being grateful, by being thankful to Wakantanka for providing the Tatanka, the buffalo, they they would have a good hunt next year. But if they weren't that way, if they took it for granted, their understanding and wasn't there, but probably the reality, because I've been there in other similar situations where it plays out this way, but they probably didn't have a good hunt next year. They probably they, the bison probably stayed away. And I've had it happen in my life. I left my place one time farming and we had an understanding with the deer and the deer around there. Uh, we, you know, we knew them. We had a relationship with them. Um, one of them, we actually rewilded that just wandered up and it was amazing to watch her. You know, we reintegrated her into the herd slowly and they, they finally accepted her. And then she went on to have twins a couple of years in a row and we knew her. And then there was a, a deer there called Pachi Mama. I called her, you know, mother Earth, who, who was really in kind of taking care of things. And I'd watch bucks out in the woods uh, playing together. Um, yeah, they run after the girls a certain time of year, but it was never brutal. I never once saw them clash. I mostly saw them just, you know, but we got, let's go get her. Um, and all these lies, see, about how it does, you know, like, Matiko doesn't believe in win-win. What Tico believes in duality, win, lose, like somebody has to lose, right? Mm -mm. It doesn't have to be that way. The, the nature of reality is if, if you just practice reciprocity, then it can always be a win, win. And, and that's what it should be. And that's when the earth's in harmony. And that's when people are peaceful. And that's when nature is peaceful. And that's when the animals come back to be hunted. And that's when uh, the birds come to sing to you when things, when you're doing the right things. And I just, in my own life, know this is true. I, I always see animals at, at times when things are good, you know, or they, or, or they have to tell me something or they, they warn me of something, but you learn to listen to that. You learn that that's real and that somewhere, somehow part of our understanding has been wiped out. And, and I maintain that it is because the Royal Societies, the Anunnaki crown that invaded us have lied to us about the nature of reality. It's just that simple. So it's not really a, we lost our spirituality, woo woo. It's more like we just lost our understanding of science and how the world works and, and logic and reality. And, and you look at a tree and the tree's a tree. It's not a rock, it's a tree. And so look at where we are now. Um, a man is a woman. A woman is a man. Um, what they want is a machine is a human. I mean, a human is a machine. And these satanic Nephilim Anunnaki are scrambling again, like they did at the Tower of Babel when they scrambled, according to many Native American tribes, their, their languages were scrambled. And at one time, they could all talk. At one time, they could hear the animals talk in their language. At one time, everything talked to each other and everything and everyone understood each other. And then again, we were, we were brutalized. We were, we were by these people, um, the, the medieval era. I mean, the current era of electronic feudalism, I call it, um, which, which is what they want again. And we've been traumatized and we, and we don't believe those things, those things, you know, if you bring these things up in the mainstream, people laugh at you. Uh, oh, 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 I'm so smart and, and they're so dumb and, but they don't know. 
and, and they just don't understand. And so that's why Indians are patronized, right? And that's why, yeah, big white brother, like what you were doing, go out and help the Indians, you know. You know, one, one party just hates the Indians. The other one thinks they need help, the noble savage. They don't need help. <laughs> they just need to be left alone. They just need to be left alone. Yep. And then, like say, we need to learn from them because we're the we're the idiots here. Uh, the Western man, the the, the developed uh, technological advanced machine driven man. We're we're the idiots. We're the idiots. We're the idiots. We're idiots. And, and, and they're really smart and they have a lot to say. And yes, there's problems with alcohol. And yes, there's problems with whatever on these reservations. Gee, I wonder why after what they've been through. But the old elders remain and that knowledge remains. And we had better tune into it pretty soon because the older folks are dying. And it's a struggle to maintain the languages in these tribes, even. It just is. It's not going well. People say, oh, isn't it great? They're learning their language. Again. Well, actually, no, it's not going well. I know it's not because I hear from Lakota and they can't get kids interested in the language anymore. They're all on their phones and their computers and their devices and their screens. And they're being sucked into this AI system, this Nephilim crown satanic cult. That's where it's at. But I mean, do what you want. You know, it's your life. If you want to have a, a happy life. Um, my suggestion would be to un start begin to understand the nature of reality. You know, you just said they need to be left alone. It took me five years of working with the Hopi tribe to actually quit and walk away because I realized they needed to be left alone. The people in the villages are the ones who who preserved and contained the ancient wisdoms and practices. And it was those people working in the government, which was established by the United States, just like American government. And I, I, I realized, oh, my God, I need to leave these people alone. And I resigned publicly in front of a group of 100 people. Good for you. Uh, I, I'm not yeah. saying this to pat myself on the shoulder. No. It, 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 it was a, a journey that I was on. Yeah. took a long time to figure it out sure, and coming too. into contact and come into contact with these people. And I realized that, yes, we were the Bahana. We were the Wetiko. We were the outsiders. We were the ones that brought them evil. We were the ones that tried to change their ways when their ways were the original ways, yeah. the ways yeah. that were yeah. determined yeah. by the creator or the force or whatever you want to call it. Now, I, I want to point out to a number of people, um, you talk a lot about research and about facts. You keep coming back to the royal bloodlines, the crown, the Anunnaki. And for a lot of people, this scares the crap out of them. They, they just can't deal with it. You know that better than I do. But I'd like to focus now back on you and your journey. Because in reading your books and knowing you, I think you've been on a personal and spiritual journey, an awakening. And you've also been, at the same time, on an intellectual journey, researching all of this information that you've been involved in, and that has developed and it's grown and it's expanded. And I think it's come to the point today where this book, and I want to encourage everybody to get a copy of this book. I'll put it in the description, Royal Bloodline, Watiko, and the Great Awakening. Now, Dean, I want to get a little personal with you now. Uh, you have a chapter in the book that I absolutely loved. Uh, I think it showed so much about you and your awakening to what is really real. Talk to me about Slow Loris. <laughs> Slow Loris, yeah. I kind of wanted to use it for the title, but Jill said it was too far out and people wouldn't get it. <laughs> She's probably right. But, okay, so, yeah, Slow Loris is my cat. And, um... He's 11 and a half. 
and he's a uh, he's a character and um i had two other cats and um they passed and tragically and um and you know I, I had cats when i was a kid and i had dogs when i was a kid and i guess i just took it for granted i lived on a farm we had sheep cows pigs pheasants chickens ducks geese animals everywhere right and um i was in 4-h showed livestock a judge livestock i was on the south dakota state champion livestock judging team um i won many awards for showmanship um including grand champion showman at a county fair um that was my life you know i grew up on a farm i was uh very sheltered from the outside world um but we had dogs and cats okay so later in life um I got dogs and uh, again and had two dogs for mm, geez, 15 plus years and they went everywhere with us and um they passed uh let's see milo passed in 2005 and buck in 2003 and um then went for traveling for a while and no pets go traveling to asia and went to australia new zealand indonesia the time went to Africa, um, Southern Africa. One time went to Argentina and just traveled, just took off, traveled. Came back. Um, my last farm uh, in Missouri um, on my birthday. <laughs> on my birthday, um, we're canoeing the Buffalo River in Arkansas, you know, beautiful river, and a hot day and jumping in swimming holes and just having fun. Got home with a couple friends of ours. Got home and um, there was a mama cat on the porch with two kittens. And she had been coming around for a couple of days, just the mama. And we, you know, we didn't know. We just thought, well, there's a cat. Okay. Um, but what she was doing was she was sussing us out because she got in a bad spot where, you know, they, they were living in a hole in the ground and they were around, you know, she couldn't support feeding these three cats much longer. She's real skinny. And um, so that's where I never have pets, but here they come, you know. And what are you going to do? These cute little kittens and their mom. And so, okay, we let them in. So uh, that was Harvey Wallbanger and Silent Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which, as you saw, I dedicated the book to. And... um. I don't have the book handy and I don't remember the exact dedication even, but something to do with the love these cats gave me while the humans got lost in their screens and they did. And they got me through, uh, <laughs> sorry. That's okay, my friend. This happens to me all the time. And yeah. anyway, uh, they got me through it. They got me through it. And um, yeah, amazing animals. Um, so, so then I had cats again. So first time I had cats since I was a kid. So anyway, anyway, Mama brings two kittens. Yeah, Mama she brings kittens with you. And then <laughs> a couple of days later, tell me what happened. Yeah. Let's see. Uh. You really did read the book. <laughs> I knew you did, but um, so yeah, a couple of days later, um this other cat shows up and on the back porch. And at first I thought it was Harvey. Um, because it looked kind of similar. Then second look, and it was two in the morning, right? And this other and no, it's not Harvey, yeah, it's a different one. So this is slow Loris, and this is where he gets his name and long story how he gets his name but essentially it's the, the meaning of the chapter um he just ran off and we had to get you know mom cat and the other kittens and use them as kind of bait we you know took him out in the woods finally because he wouldn't come in and um brought food and you know all this stuff and kind of left them there and then kind of i don't know somehow got him in but there he was so there are three kittens now and um 2017 the other cats 
tragically died. That's I could just barely talk about it still six years ago. And I don't want to get into how, but it was bad. It was like just like evil uh, in one case, just evil descendant on my property. Probably and probably because I was researching and writing and, and you know there's all kinds of attacks uh, like this uh, on everything. You know, I have all things that whatever. I don't want to get into it. I don't care. But bottom line, um we died. And so uh so Loris um remains and and uh missed his brothers uh hard for him uh got through it and by the time we left uh missouri uh to go back to my home state of south dakota um he was ready to because of uh, the sadness and missing his brothers and so we became the pride and we became buddies and more and more and more and there was just always something about this cat and um i just in my gut and i still believe it to this day that whenever something bad would if, if something bad were to happen to him um there's going to be a cataclysmic event in the world i'm not joking i mean you know and um so i gotta i gotta take him all the way i gotta take him to old age and let him die that way like that yeah he's kind of like uh he's like the buffalo calf woman and he's and he's white and he has a butterfly on his back it's crazy and um he was sent here anyway well they're all sent here they're all angels. They're all good spirits. Uh, who knows how it all works? But these are anyway. These are my spirit guides. You know these 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 animals, these dogs, these cats have always uh, steered me in the right direction. It goes back to this reciprocity. So you take care of an animal that needs taken care of. And for example, the dogs uh, made me stay in America because I couldn't take them overseas because I didn't want to get them vaccinated. And yeah, that resulted in me becoming a successful writer and being discovered and selling my books and getting my word and getting the word out and most importantly being part of changing the world so that allowed me to do that if i just would have took off didn't have dogs i probably would be a gypsy i'd probably be smoking weed on some beach in india <laughs> right so that didn't happen all right let me, let me let me take you back to the three cats <laughs> Uh, in the beginning, they were outside cats. Then winter yep. came, and you let them come inside. The next thing you know, they were sleeping on the bed. Mm. <laughs> they, uh, I can relate to this. Okay, it happens. Yeah, a lot of people can. That's true. <laughs> we have a stray. A cat. Uh, three or four years ago, that <clears throat> somehow ended up becoming a member of the family. Yeah. So. <clears throat> You talked about the passing of the two other cats, but slow, slow Loris. Uh, I think if I'm correct and I'm quoting you properly, yeah. yeah, you you said he's your role model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me, yeah. tell me a little bit about that. Oh uh, yeah, well because he. I mean, it has to do with personality. It has to do with relationship. It has to do with well, whatever. But tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, he just. He's emblematic of everything good in this world. You know, he's he's unconditional love, mainly. I mean, that's mainly it. And, and it, you know, I just strive to be like that. I strive to be not a reactionary, even with bad people. Um, you have to maintain your cool. You have to you have to keep bringing love to people, not necessarily those people. Actually, that's really important that you don't bring love to those people. Because they don't deserve it. You, you, but you have to love the people that need love, and the, the the indigenous people, the the people of the earth, the people in Gaza, the people you know, the people that suffer. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the light. The way, live simply. Carry back, back in the mountains. Oh, no possessions that possess you. <laughs> the truth. Tell the truth about the Illuminati, Habsburg bloodline dynasty, and help save the world from them for all of humanity. The light. Help with compassion and love, especially for those who are underprivileged and suffering. Okay. And Loris just, you know, he's brave too. He's a very brave cat. And um, he's kind of a badass. I wouldn't mess with him if I was another cat. He's like 20 pounds. And um, good hunter, but Bob and Harvey were better hunters, actually. <clears throat> but when they'd hunt, they'd all bring back the 
that I'll bring back, you know, like Bob, Bob is the best hunter. And then Harvey got to be kind of the best hunter actually in the end. He was really quick, but he needed Bob to show him a few things. They're both good. Um, they did all, but Laura sometimes too would bring in, but usually those two would bring a chipmunk or a mouse or a wood rat or a vole or something. And then they would just give it to Loris or Loris would give it to Harvey or Bob would give it to Loris or, or Loris would give it to Bob or Harvey would give it to, <clears throat> they never ate it themselves when there was three of them there. Now, if it was just them, yeah, they're chowing down. But but if they're hunting and they hunt together, they, they form this kind of triangulation on the prey. And just to watch this and just to watch this lesson in the nature of reality, like this is the way. If Bob gives that mouse to Harvey, guess what? Bob's going to get another mouse. The hunting is going to be good because reciprocity occurred. He understood the nature of reality. He was grateful and he was kind to his brother and gave that mouse to him. Lakota, same way in Lakota culture, the hunter always eats last. And that's just because he understands the nature of reality and that if he eats last, he'll be respected more by the tribe and all his peers and that he'll also have successful hunting uh, later. And so see this, this way of thinking is so different from what we're facing in this modern world. Um, not just from the elite crown, but now it's filtered down to so much of society. So many people have, have embraced this grab it and go mentality um, where there is no reciprocity. And every single one of them who I have observed has a shitty life of debt, slavery, possessions, loneliness, isolation, da 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 da, alcoholism, addiction to Facebook, you name it. They're not healthy people. Most people on this planet right now in the Western world, now I'm not talking about the third world and Russia, and I think that's a different, you know, conversation. They're doing a little better. But most people in the Western world are not healthy. And they're not right in the head. And that's what we're up against. But we have to talk about this. We have to give them an alternative. Because so many people don't know about this alternative even. Because they've been lied to by the education system and all the crown-generated textbooks. They've been lied by their parents to start with because their parents are confused from the beginning. And then they're just lied to their whole life. And they're taught that it's a pyramid. You want to get to the top. And, you know, the hell with the people at the bottom. And um you know it's a psychosis it's just it's it, it's it's the watiko this is the watiko and what we need to do is to get rid of that is just to understand the nature of reality it's just really so simple and that i believe is the central point of the book is that our problem you know yada 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 about the anunnaki and the royal society and yada 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 and i shouldn't say it because it's really important but but whatever it doesn't matter we have to understand better the nature of reality and then we'll have happy lives and then we won't have wars and then we won't have uh, we'll have free energy and we'll have all these things because we're finally scientific about things logical about things again and we finally sit down it's like look action observe inference conclusion but people don't even observe anymore they don't pay attention to anything and they're walking around with preconceived notions and they'll those are the, which are formulated by the establishment through an MK ultra style project monarch. that's now gone mass and it's a mass monarch project right now using screens to reinforce dumb ideas, to reinforce misconceptions, to reinforce lies. It's intelligence operation, you know, driven, um, of course, and we're in a bad way, but we're also in a good way because the great remembering, the great remembering is proceeding apace and gaining ground. And my book sells last month where I have never seen anything like it. And people are waking up and people in the United States, even 32% of the U.S. citizens now support Israel. I don't know if you knew that. 32%. Even Biden was forced to come out, what, yesterday? And he didn't talk about Israel at all. He said, my first priority is the Palestinian people and their well-being.
And you have to do that because 100 people in his State Department wrote him a letter protesting their, his unconditional support of the bombing of what? Hospitals and schools. Hospitals and schools. And mm -mm. so we're coming to a head here. We're coming to a collision on a collision course with these with Tico. There's always going to be the powerful elite that they're not, they know exactly what's going on. They do know the nature of reality, but they hide it from us. They hate us that know it. And they know we're more powerful than they are. They know that's the key. <laughs> they know we're more powerful than they are. Because, because creator Wakantanka, the creative force, is way more powerful than Satan and his minions of fallen angels. Or however you want to look at it, Archons, Wetikos, however you want to look at it. Just evil, just deception, just bad, good versus bad. So simple. That's what we're at. And, and there's a collision course coming. And I know because I have great faith and I observe slow Loras and I observe the deer in my backyard and I observed, yeah, the deer crossing the road in the book. And hey, by the way, when we left uh, current place, uh, the turkeys, they, they did a circle around our building <laughs> and they were saying, you know, see you later. And maybe putting a shield on that building, too, because we were kind of stabilizing force at that apartment complex let's just say um good's gonna win now whether or not it happens in my lifetime your lifetime you just or how it happens or you know is there gonna have to be a total wipe out of humanity maybe by a cosmic ray because nobody got it or not enough i don't know i don't know that i just know that in the end good always conquers evil and that is a truism and that has to do with the circle and that has to do with the nature of reality so as far as doom and gloom, I never have it. I never have it, really. I mean, it's real frustrating. It's real uh, aggravating. And But I, I really have a lot of fun in my life. You know, like uh, we're snowbirding it this year. So we're going to go to Florida. And, uh, yeah, and I just don't let it bother me. And, and, and you know, I mean, that's what people got to do. It's like, it's, again, it's a win-win. You don't have to give up your happiness to fight these bastards and you shouldn't because you're giving that away to them you're, you're giving that energy to them if you get in that doom and glue mode and just stay there oh, everything sucks why no it doesn't go outside just go look at it go look at the creation go check it out and then talk to some birds this morning see what they got to say it's way more articulate than what you're going to hear from any humans right now so but you got to do that and you got to kind of set boundaries and you got to kind of go i'm going to go over here now and y'all can do whatever you want i got business to take care of i'm in a war i'm in a guerrilla war i don't have time to get bogged down in whatever your drama um so i'm a happy guy so um i think that's also important for people who watch this which i know are activist people just remember that just remember to be thankful every morning for waking up to start with because maybe you you didn't wake up instead and what a blessing to have another day another shot at it uh another day to to see the beautiful natural world and but to you know you obviously you have to get out into nature as well you can't sit in your house and go to the screens and be affected by all this propaganda um you have to go outside you have to separate from the propaganda we do these interviews i say a laptop's a tool when we're done with this interview, it gets turned off and I go outside. It's like a hammer. Take it out of the shop, then put it away when you're done. But this technology that we're using is the beast system. It, it is the beast system. And we use it like a weapon. Throw it back at them. Oh, gee, thanks. You know, stream yard. Throw it back at them. But we know. We have to know. We have to know. This is important. We have to know that this, is a, this whole technological era is part of the agenda, the central part of the agenda and and we cannot be addicted to this we cannot overuse this and we cannot stay on this too long because we don't know what's coming out of the other end of these computers we don't know what's coming out of the other end of these phones um i'm gonna tell you it's way worse than people think way worse and there's mind control involved and you don't know what's coming at you it's like anything else you know what's coming at you you can defend yourself you can okay it, this is happening a bear is running at me therefore i will run up a tree but if you don't see the bear, if you just like, la, 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 the bear's not there, la, 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 no, the CIA wouldn't follow us, the CIA wouldn't monitor our house, they wouldn't put cameras in our, oh, yeah, they would. 
Oh, yeah, they would. So if you know that, you're ready. And you got God on your side. But God only helps those who help himself. Walk on time only helps those who walk the circle, who walk the good red road. And so remember that. It's real important. And um, but yeah, um, I appreciate you reading it, Regis, and all my books, man. And um, I really do. It means a lot that you liked it because you're really smart. And I think it's my best book, written book, my best written book. Maybe it's all, all right. you say. Um, yeah, you're probably right. It's probably my last book because I don't know what else to say. I, I, I tried to just, <clears throat> yeah. I want to come back to a couple of things. We're, we're going to do a few more interviews and we're going to go deeper and deeper into different parts of your book. You've alluded to many of the topics, many of the dangers, many of the evils. And I know that needs to be explored a whole lot more, but <clears throat> I've been really interested in your own personal journey. And I pick up on a few words and phrases that you've mentioned that to me are very important. You mentioned God or the Creator, Watanka. You mentioned love. You mentioned that we had to get back to love and rediscover that. And the way you show that is by embracing the needs of the underprivileged, the suffering, those that are being persecuted wherever they are around the world, right now in Gaza. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I used to be a Roman Catholic priest. I did know that. You told me. I was trained and educated in Rome. Uh, can't say that I'm a an expert in sacred scripture, but I'm knowledgeable about it. Mm -hmm. And people ask me today, uh, are you religious? And I guess, no, not not in any way, shape, or form, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm more of a spiritual person. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, I really love and follow the radical Jesus. Yeah, that's it. Whom religions have all distorted. That Jesus never, never founded a church. He never created dogma. He never created mm -hmm. laws no. except one. And he said that you must love God and you must love one another and you must forgive <laughs> and you must forgive. There's your reciprocity. There's your reciprocity. There, there's your understanding of what Jesus really said. You mentioned the way, the truth, and the light. They, it said Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. Well, if you follow this message of love and reciprocity, you will understand life, and you will find favor in God or in human nature, in humanity. And that's where I've ended up. And uh, I think that uh, it's hard for a lot of people to swallow to, because we've been so programmed for millennia, really. The programming has gone on for uh, 8,500 years, according to you. So, Dean, I can't thank you for, enough for this um, personal insight, this personal discovery of who you are who, and the journey that you've been on. It's been an academic, intellectual journey, but a very spiritual journey. And this is what I've really related to. So I can't thank you enough. I hope you can find the time to come back with me maybe in a week from now and and go a little bit deeper into the book, because I think what I tried to establish tonight was who is this Dean Henderson? What is he really like? What does this man think about? What is it, what is it that motivates him? And I think that we were able to bring that out tonight, Dean, and I was very happy to do that. So I look forward to another discussion going a little bit deeper into the book I want to promote it. I am so happy to hear that the sales on this book are really going very well for you. It's a book. People do not have to read anything you've written before. They need to read this book. Mm -hmm. Dean Henderson, thank you so much. Yeah, hey, Regis, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, just so folks know, uh, they can subscribe to my, my writing again at Dean Henderson's Substack. Um, for free 
you know, just click the whatever button. And um, Jill worked tirelessly for the last five months to get my own left hook site, which was on WordPress, which was the one deleted. Had over 600, I think 800 articles and interviews. So I'm with you, I believe, for sure, from the past. And we got it all back up on Substack. So, and you know, that's where you can find my writing on the internet again, because I was gone for a while as far as, you know, writing or whatever. And then my books are at Amazon. Just type in Dean Henderson, Amazon, if anyone's interested. And I just sure appreciate having me, Regis. And I'm glad you missed the storm. And, uh, you know, we'll talk soon. Mm -hmm.